Acharya and Kathy Bergen for our last um, panel, which is, to, to, um, I think the title is something about reparations, write-offs and write-downs. Is that about right? Uh, future directions, colon, write-offs, write-downs, and reparation. Perfect. And um, I think although each of the three uh, speakers come from quite different disciplines and at first glance the, the, the work might not be sort of immediately adjacent to each other. There's a lot there's a lot to connect them. And, and John has been working for a long time on hassle debt since before it was cool to work on hassle debt. You might uh, yeah <laughs> um, and has, has written at length about how debt became key to social participation in the US and the UK after various uh, welfare regime shifts. Uh, through the 80s and 90s, and uh, she's just published, is it out yet? Yeah, it was just published about three weeks ago. Okay, so uh, should we abolish household debt? And on page one, she says yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably worth reading the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, Jonah's book is about taking the, the techniques that are used to write down through long-term refinancing and write off through discharging non-performing loans, the techniques that are frequently used to bail out large corporate entities, um, large financial entities, and applying that to household debt, um, including things like uh, dealing with debt that has been acquired since the financial crisis at, you know, completely unjust interest rates when they've been historically low interest rates that have been available to financial and corporate houses. Um, and part of this is about uh, John's broader project in the book is about to dealing with financial melancholy, the fact that people haven't quite fully come to terms with um, with what happened in the crisis and many of us are still living with the kind of toxic debt products that other larger entities don't have to live with anymore, so why shouldn't those techniques be used at the household scale? Um, Gabi has also recently published a fantastic book, um, Rethinking Racial Capitalism. Um, and Gabi describes the book as, as a work of hope. Um, and I think it's a really important, it's a really important work for the careful way that race, racialization processes and capitalism is brought into relation. It's rather than seeing as race, racism as a symptom of capitalism, um, nor seeing racism as something that began with capitalism, nor about how, nor looking at how capitalism treats different racial groups. Show you also how the differentiating processes of capitalism, the way that certain people are rendered surplus or not, or rendered precarious or not, intersects with and sometimes enters into this kind of like unpleasant synchronicity with processes of racialization. Um, and because it's a book of hope, it involves this careful understanding of how racialization and capitalism intersect. I think one, one of the quotes in the book that stood out to me is, we cannot sustain an understanding of capitalism as complex and evolving alongside an account of racial capitalism as monolithic and frozen in space. Right? So how are we going to understand the racial and racial capitalism in a way that is as sophisticated as you might need to understand the capitalism in, in racial um, and also there's some, there's some really good stuff in Gary's book about reparations and the contract, um, which made me think, uh, which yesterday's discussion about the contract that John was involved uh, in as well brought to mind, and yes, you should read the book. Um, <laughs> Kathy has done amazing work on black communist politics in, in, in the US, and has also been working with her colleagues at Brighton on the idea of reparative histories. And the recent paper in Race and Class, I think it's, it, I really enjoyed it because there's so little that I read that is about Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, 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 this is a paper that takes, um, connects reparative histories to uh, the kind of fin forensic financial tracing that's also popped up over the last few days by taking data from the, the, the Legacies of Slave Ownership project that a few people have mentioned and looking at who in Brighton received that, and connecting the sort of receipt of slave compensation by the kind of seafront regency fancy people, um, connecting that with 
untold stories of slave rebellion uh, in, in the Caribbean. And um, in, in the paper with Anita Ruprecht, Kathy describes uh, the temporality of sort of comparative history as about dwelling between the no longer and the not yet. And again, using Avery Gordon, who came up yesterday, and, and trying to bring, trying to in some way overcome the tendency that we see in the UK now to treat the uh, there and then of colonial racialized violence as something entirely unrelated to the here and now mm. forms of racialization for any moment, nostalgia and so on. So um, I think there's a lot that unites the, uh, the work of our, our three speakers in terms of thinking about repair, thinking about restitution, thinking about these uh, different temporalities of, of capitalism and racialization, and I'm not going to talk anymore. Um, so, shall we start? Um, Max, what's the order on the program? <laughs> oh, perfect. So, we're this way. Okay. And I really am the other people who didn't need notes. I'm not that tired. I'm afraid I'll ramble without notes, so I didn't have notes. Um, but I want to thank you all very much for the invitation. I really, really enjoyed the conference. It's been fascinating. My head is still fizzing, actually, with the panel this morning. Um, with John uh, Adam and the Dean, so all sorts of work, so it's been really good. Um, but I also spent some time kind of racking my brain to figure out what to speak about today because I am literally a cultural historian by trade. Um, so I thought I might find some handy novel really, to <laughs> speak about all these themes. But one of the reasons I left uh, literature at the discipline was conferences with well meaning geeky boys talking in detail about novels and then banging on about Jared at the end. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak about novels, okay? Um, and actually, I wouldn't speak at all, because both more or less <laughs> summarised what I decided uh, to focus on uh, for this paper. I want to look less at my own work on African-American communism and far more with that larger project that I just need to regret uh, around the concept of uh, reparative histories, and not least because of the title of this panel, um, Future direction, right off, right times, and reparation. And that kind of frames all sorts of questions that is parted into the work that I do with Anita. So, our, so our, our kind of project um, centers around the idea of reparative history. And this isn't strictly reparations in terms of the politics of compensation, um, although it's that too. What we're really interested in is the space that is opened up by the call for reparations to think about history and to think about memory in relation to how the acknowledgement of historical colonial crimes are frequently mobilised, and in particular um, how they're mobilised in a way that neutralises the past, that, if you like, negates those connections between the racialised past and the racialised present structures which continue to exploit the identified racialised subjects now in the terms of neoliberal globalisation. So, you know, no apology for slavery, for instance, would be one quite obvious example here. But to be honest, I find it really quite hard to think of anything that couldn't be talked about under that rubric in terms of the denial of racialised past and connections to the now. So reparative history, if the term or the concept is useful at all, is also intended to regalvanise a politics which underlines the ways in which black resistance has been downplayed, overlooked, cauterized, or moderated in relation to liberal narratives of imperialism, both historical and contemporary. So those liberal narratives which disavow the connections between the history of racialized capitalism and the current structures of racialized capitalism, and therefore they read the past, if you like, as anomalous to modernity. Whereas the black radical tradition, as has been widely noted, is, is one that has traced traditional concepts of modernity, both in both spatial and temporal terms, very, very differently to that liberal tradition. So, for instance, very famously, C.R.R. James' work on the plantation, which is the plantation as a prototype of the factory, is a way which kind of re makes us look very, very different at the, at the idea of capital production and factory, um, and looking through a lens. Um, of, of black labour. 
So the Black Radical Transnational Framework for understanding the vectors of resistance which have shaped contemporary anti-racist struggles is also central to understanding global racialized capitalism outside of those claims of the nation states of empire. So the Black Radical tradition is really important to our work in, in a very different way. We need to look at you know, different centuries <laughs> in relation to that. But certainly in terms of, of how transnational and interconnected that history is and what that does to kind of stay liberal narratives of empire um, and, and, and the place of black labour and black life within the empire. So part of the project, therefore, of reparative history is to draw attention to the ways in which racialized discourses of liberal democracy have not only marginalised black and brown labour and black and brown resistance, but actually that that narrative is dependent upon those erasures. So, for example, reparations itself only looks like special pleading if one reads the history of slavery and colonialism as aberrations, as opposed to as constitu const constitutive of liberal democracy and its role well in race-making capitalism. So, our wider project, if you like, is part of, if you like, is in part about those racialising blind spots of liberal humanism and about how attending to that blindness might enable forms of reparative history, which as I say, we haven't locked down and still um, a, a, a quite problematic terms in some ways. Maybe we can talk about that in discussion. So we suggest that the idea of the reparative might be conceptualised in terms of the need to concurrently trace how the legacies of colonialism and slavery have been racialized in a manner which precisely refuses the black radical claim on, and indeed the transformation of concepts of liberty and freedom, um, and how much the black radical tradition has exposed and rejected those liberal paradigms, which placed them as objects of paternalistic discourses in which their oppression was unfortunate but unconnected to the working modes of capitalist accumulation. So there's quite a lot in there, and it all sounds a little bit abstract to be unpicked. But I was thinking during this conference, actually, um, I'm not a historian of finance capital, but to think about there is always a challenge in looking at how the structures of finance capital has organised and destroyed life, and at the same time to keep the space open for resistance and the important ways in which resistance doesn't just work alongside capital, <laughs> but actually has shaped in many ways uh, the sort of society in which we live for good or for bad. So what I want to concentrate on for the rest of this paper, therefore, is the concept of the reparative in relation to this town, as Paul mentioned, and this town in terms of the legacies of Atlantic slavery. And as many of you will know, Britain's amnesia about slavery is quite clear in that its remembrance of it is the moment of abolition. So um, as Susan Thorne Susan Thorne has artfully paraphrased really in relation to Britain's cultural memory of slavery, she says, quote, this is paraphrasing, if you like, dominant British notion of slavery, the villains of slavery's history are the culturally deracinated planters who are out of place in a metropolitan culture distinguished by its anti-slavery movement. Moreover, the government responsible for compensating slave owners also freed the empire of slaves. And for that, our gratitude, not censor, is in order. End quote. And really, so powerful is that narrative of benign Britain when it comes to slavery that a now infamous but very quickly deleted text from the government's Treasury Department in February uh, 2018 is really telling. And it informed the British public that, quote, millions of you have helped to end the slave trade through your taxes. The tweet was um, hashtag Friday Fact and to proudly congratulate the British public for their and their ancestors' generosity in ending slavery. Quote, very quickly deleted this text, this tweet. <laughs> Did you know? In 1833, Britain used £20 million, 40% of its national budget, to buy the freedom of all the slaves in the empire. The amount of money borrowed for the Slavery Abolition Act was so large that it wasn't paid off until 2015, which means that living British citizens helped to pay for the end of the slave trade. Now, apparently ignorant of the fact that that compensation, as most of you will know, of 20 million, 17 billion in today's terms, was paid as compensation to slave owners. This errant tweet actually underscores, I think, the proximity of racial slavery to contemporary Britain. 
I've written that would much rather focus on, quote, the future than the painful past. That's a quote from Cameron when he asked about reparations in Jamaica in 2015, before he went on to talk about reparations in the same breath as building a huge jail in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So I think it is, I'm really glad that tweet happened, because I think it's really interesting, it's a very interesting by the fact that Britain's multicultural population have been paying off the debt to white supremacy for nearly 200 years. And that the financial legacies um, of slavery in the tweet are so easily figuratively imagined as ones paid to the enslaved by the good citizens of the nation. And that moment, if you like, of racialized historical amnesia and denial is only really stunning or remarkable at all because the factual inaccuracy draws attention to this otherwise unremarkable rewriting of British imperial past. Three months after that tweet, in response to the Windrush scandal, uh, which saw Afro-Caribbean British citizens become illegal in the hostile environment um, created by the anti-immigration policies of the Tory government, David Lamy exhorted in Parliament, quote, we need to remember our history in Britain, when we talk about slavery, we tend to just talk about its abolition. The Windrush story begins in the 17th century, when British slave traders stole seven, sorry, 12 million Africans from their homes and took them to the Caribbean, sold them into slavery to work on plantations. The wealth of this country was built on the backs of the Windrush generation's ancestors." End quote. And that relationship between black labour and British wealth, which Lamy insists upon remembering, is a relationship that is constantly disavowed in liberal histories of empire. As Captain Hall powerfully argues, quote, capital was not anonymous. It had blood cursing through its veins, and this had implications for how it functioned on both sides of the Atlantic. So with the circulations of knowledge that Anita and I trace in our very different but related areas of expertise are multidirectional in relation to the black radical tradition, and um, slave rebellions and all sorts of other things. The circulations of finance, which, if you like, circulate, are less multidirectional. As has been mentioned earlier on today, um, the, the legacies of the British Slave Ownership Project is really important here, and they have literally traced the money of Britain's slavery, Britain's slavery past. Okay. Um, so, this is concentrated in particular on the absentee landlords or their relatives who were resident in Britain in order to document the vast sums that were paid out to men and women residing in British towns and cities. And again, this was mentioned earlier on in relation uh, to John's paper, but the kind of sir, 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 I can never say this word, circuitous. Is it circuitous? That's the word. <laughs> These roots of the money, which, if you think about it, is paid by a British state to enrich. Or a British state that has been enriched by black labour to compensate for white losses, which ends up in the purses and wallets um, of British citizens. Citizens whose only relationship to the horrors of plantation was evident in the financial ledgers which bequeathed them these sums. And as people will know, the LBS has tracked over 40,000 of these compensation claims. They're available on the website. And trawling through their database, really, of cold cash, it's, you know, which has been exchanged for property humans, and this is an extremely dispiriting interconnected history between the drawing rooms of Britain and the plantations of the Caribbean. And it demonstrates really the extent of slave ownership in metropolitan Britain, and especially the ways in which it was not restricted to the extremely wealthy. For many British people owed their, owed their wealth to the ownership of peoples on the island of the Caribbean. And this fact, I think, complicates the spatial and class boundaries of traditional histories of empire. The money in the pockets of many bourgeois British citizens was directly related to slavery, not only in terms of the wealth of the British colonial uh, state, but also circulating within the British domestic sphere. And so along with Renise Burbrecht, many would have seen speak yesterday, my colleague Joe Scott, we're in the process, as Paul mentioned, of tracing these monies in Brighton, and we've only really begun this project of mapping. But a total of 69 slave owners and former slave owners had Brighton and Hove addresses between about 1800 and 1880. And amongst uh, other things, we're quite interesting about following the money here is also, this is a moment of, of Brighton's kind of ascendancy as a recent resort. 
So only two of the 69 are bright and born. 45 are retired or died, or died here. So they came to Brighton to lose Brighton to die. I'm sorry, they didn't come to die, but they, <laughs> they died here anyway. <laughs> Um, and I won't go into all of them, or that many of them, because I'm running out of time. But I think what was really interesting about the, um, the, the people that we found, and the LBS is found, how many were women, first and foremost. And we came across um, two sisters in Brighton, the Anderson sisters. And slave compensation was bequeathed to these two women, of 12 Bedford Street, Brighton, just off the seafront, of £222,000 in October 1836. Um, this was for the emancipation of 150 enslaved peoples. Um, there's lots of ways to do this math, but we, according to Nick Baker, do this on this forums. This is equivalent today in relation to the earnings of the average worker and everything else of about £1,798,000. What's interesting about the Andersons for us is that their father, Andrew Anderson, was a planter in Tortola. And the money that was received by Caroline and Anna was in relation to the family's historic Brewer's Bay estate in Tortola. The reason that was interesting is because unrelated to this, Anita had been doing work on a little-known rebellion in Tortola in 1831. So we found this extraordinary moment where the money bequeathed to these sisters in Brighton um, in the late 1830s was connected to an estate where there was a little-known rebellion in 1831. Now, this isn't just a dragging to historical moments to make me speak, actually. It is a way we thought of thinking to precisely try and think about black resistance and, if you like, um, compensation, financial capital, um, in the same frame, in the same frame of analysis, um, so that the importance of resistance, black resistance, is not lost when looking at the horrors of, of, of colonial finance. Um, and then I will just finish up. I had a note, and my father was going to my mom. So, um, so tracing, if you like, the kind of the, the dialectic between past and present, between the global and the local, we hope helps to kind of address the effect of erasure of, the, of, the, of those connections, if you like, between the metropol metropolitan accumulation and everyday resistances that were practiced in the Caribbean. And this was an erasure or a forgetting that was inaugurated by the compensation, compensation scheme itself. Um, the compensation scheme effectively laundered property in human beings and the memory of holding property in human beings into abstract cash, and thereby set into motion a powerful process of metropolitan disinvestment, it was mentioned in the last, in the last panel, and also disavowal. So in telling the story of white settlement and entitlement in both the financial and geographical sense of the world, we can make connections really, I think, to our own historical moment um, in this heritage town um, in relation uh, to our contemporary moment. So if you think about the frantic, particularly in Brexit Britain, but also in Trump's America, around the statue wars and the Confederacy, these kind of claims of heritage, these claims of legacy, are rallying forms of white supremacy and colonial apologetics that precisely seek to deny the interval, as Paul had already said, which is what Avery Gordon has called the no longer and the not yet, and therefore to deny contemporary institutionalised racism is part of denying those violent racialised pasts. So our idea of comparative history, therefore, this is my last sentence really, is to call is a call to all sorts of kind of active and potent resistances to the, to the project of disavowing black life and black labour um, in, in its historical and race making capitalism. And that's why, if you like, we, we want to centre and think constantly about how those financial flows, if you like, are to other flows, and their flows of resistance. And um, that's what I Gone to sleep. Aha. Come up here. Don't come from there. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Right. Um. Oh, as always, I've kind of prepared the wrong thing. I feel my whole life is that. I thought it was meant to be reparations. Obviously. Yeah. I hope we'll come back around to that. Um. I would 
really liked to have written this paper, but given my employment commitments, I was not really able to write it. So you get some first thoughts, and I hope there'll be a bigger story to come. So I wanted to think about social reproduction amongst the undead, because, of course, I thought I wanted to talk about living with the spirits of capitalism. Ha, 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 only a joke for people of a certain age, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> so let's start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw when I came this morning, this crowd is too young, not this. <laughs> <laughs> but for some of us, that was a whole thing. Right. We the undead. So I think, because I was trying to think about ghosting, I was thinking, well, there's a sense in which the history of capital is capital saying to all of us in different ways, who the hell are you to be on this earth? What good are you to me? What value do you hold? unless I can see you as a source of value, just lie down and die right now. And that we can tell that story in a range of locations and think about the ways that that implied or almost explicit question is then enacted through different forms of differentiating violence. Just because the violence is differentiating doesn't mean it doesn't have some connection between it. Um, so I was thinking that in that context in which capital is the kind of master subject saying, if you live, you only live for me. Aliveness is kind of coded as productivity or the potential of productivity. And I had a big question mark when I was writing those notes, and I really hope that someone <coughs> has got something to say about that. But the idea that the only thing for humanity to be alive for is to make this thing for some, some other creature. But now that's the marker of aliveness. All of our course is fantastical, all of this is fantastical. But it's a kind of, that particular fantasy has been really powerful as a way of invisibilizing the struggle for life in many different locations. And most of all, or amongst these things, as a way of reducing all aspects of social reproduction to no more than that necessary four or two third productive economy. I would normally say, look, you know, I'm schooled in that much longer history of socialist feminism. I, I, think I would say that I wouldn't be the person I am without going through those debates. And I think that is interesting, but I think it's no longer sufficient that um, to retrieve the place of social reproduction as if we also believe that it makes sense only in relation to a productive sphere which silences the battle for life is, I think, at least a question for us right now. and should have been a question for much longer. So, I'm suggesting that in this context, which is a long context in many places, but just as a summary, that the reproduction of life on any other terms than this term of there's a real economy somewhere and I'm supplementing it, and I'm doing all this housework and baby feeding and sustaining of life, but only because we'll enter the real realm of the economic, which is also coded the slash political sometime, because that's just the anteroom to the real economy, but anything other form of reproducing life on any other terms which are not in that trajectory that eventually you all end up in the formal economy becomes a form of living death. Or nature, or subsistence, or some combination of those three. So living death is that um, you're never going to become a, a useful person for me, you're never going to um, become something something that can make value. I can't even trade you for value. If I trade you for value, you'll be depleted, but other things will happen. Or you're really just part of the landscape. I can't distinguish you from um, raw material, or I render you into raw material, or subsistence. Your way of life is an almost death which doesn't have economic value. I think those things, all of those things I'm quite confused about, but also very interesting, and I think they intersect with each other. And, and I thought, I came in quite late this morning, so I had a stomach upset last night, sorry about that. But it sounded like your first session this morning actually went into much more historical detail about some of those three terms, really, and how they intersect and don't intersect. So, I think that's something like a global history of social reproduction under capitalism, how people get split into some of these different framings. And in my imagination, I wrote a whole other lovely bit about zombies, but that will be in the written form. I'm sure you all know about the, his the history, the so reclaiming and, and, and yes, yeah, so, you know, so the term zombie comes from 
a Haitian culture that it's taken up in the West as a kind of uh, fantastical representation of a not quite registered kind of racial shame and guilt. But the other who you've depleted is coming to kill you in bound deadness. But that is also about how the racialized hordes of the global South are barely human, flesh eating, as if they are not the ones who've had their flesh eaten. So there's all of those critiques of all of those 70s movies about zombies. There's some other more recent work about why does the figure of the zombie return in this moment of neoliberal crisis. Can't tell you about any of that now, but I'm guessing some of you know about it. And certainly it might come back to poetry, so we could bring you back in later. Um, to get to my story, my small story for today, it's enough for us to just remember that colonial violence is including the extreme depletion of local economies, were almost, have almost explicitly been structured around putting together practices that can relegate some populations to the status of undead. The status of undead is that I don't have to do anything more for you because anything I might want for you has already been taken. The status of undead is also that contracts of social reproduction do not have to be maintained for you because that is not the relation we're in. So, you can... Your life is a kind of, um, well, as I said here, not at all social death. It's not part of that really non-debate, but about the ways that some kinds of um, structures of violence incorporate slow death into the business of life for some by force. So, you know, that, that just feels like now, doesn't it? But it's been going on quite a long time. Um, so, we also understand that despite the, you know, the forcible by violence and corporation of slow death into the business of life for lots of people, people kind of live, don't they? They might live unhappy, violent, pained, shortened lives, but it's not the case that this has been an absolutely effective genocidal project in which the globe is depopulated. Some, some depopulation, but look. It's part of the problem, isn't it? Oh no, the poor are still with us. The starving are still with it. Can't you just hurry up and die? <clears throat> in that undead, slowly dying remaking of life, those who have been relegated to the status of undead, of course, necessarily remake life as a multi-species endeavour ranging across the animate and the inanimate. Quite a lot of work being done about that now, about the ways in which um, those who are seen to be relegated to a space where they can never ascend to the position of being a full subject of a productive economy are living in other ways. But, you know, quite a lot of the debates about, well, what would be sustainable economy about looking at that? Quite a lot of the things about when do human beings stop being landscape? Lots of stuff about what is our relationship to other species or the spaces we live in. All of that's kind of, hmm, that's already made in the, con in the kind of contract of saying, you might be useful sometime, this is all dead already. This is all dead stuff. I can't tell it. The difference between it and the rocks. I can't tell the difference between it and the landscape. Um, now, previously, this is the only point I really have to make. This in the next slide. Previously, I think that unacknowledged social reproduction of kind of keeping yourself alive or the susta um, sustaining of life, which was not seen as a complement to the productive economy, still was seen or could be understood retrospectively as feeding the remaking of the productive economy of the metropolis. I think that's quite a tricky set of chains, and I haven't really got my head around it, but I think probably quite a lot of you swim in that water. The idea that the social reproduction of the productive sphere is not only who does the washing up and who feeds the babies, although that's part of it, but that global... Um, and a system or non-contract, it's not a contract, is it? Because one side is saying, I don't see you as the other part of the contract. But that global non-contract is not... It's not irrelevant to how the metropolis remakes itself. It might be quite complicated to understand the different ways in which that remaking goes on. But there's something going on which is supplementary in some ways. Some ways we know quite clearly that the... Um, the whole model of neocolonialism and how you continue to be a, a space for something called raw material, how some 
human beings and their quest for life becomes folded into this thing called the raw materials of neocolonialism. That's an easy way of telling that story. There's lots of other much more mysterious ways, but I think that mysterious story seems like worth flushing out with each other a bit. So that's my one point. Oh, no, spoke too long, and even my own slide went away. <laughs> okay, right, see you after that. Oh, no, right, I'm going to have to go back, because I've gone... Mm, oh, I guess it would do it like that. I never knew that I could do that. Mm. There you go. Thank you, yes, I don't normally play off my own machine. Right. <clears throat> so the other key point linked to that is, how do the, those rendered undead remake life and for whom? I've already said that one. Ah, oh, no, sorry. Right. So the shift is, if previously we thought pretty, I think without much controversy, even though we haven't had the detail, that that long tail of everyone who's not really part of the productive economy is actually in somehow supplementing a metropolis in which profit is made, what happens if there's a shift in um, the processes of where capitalism is going? <coughs> So previously we might have seen um, that making of undead hordes as a potential resource or already depleted husk. But quite a lot of people were talking about this more recent moment of financial capitalism, talk about new modes of accumulation that shift from the productive to the reproductive sphere. The ways in which people talk about indebtedness as not any one particular non-contract but a whole system in which, um, in which we're increasingly positioned to sell off our futures, mortgage our futures in many different ways. So I better be quicker and I can see the anxiety of five minutes. I've only got one more slide after this. Try and say my two points that something is going on now. That if even in the metropolis, the so called productive economy seems to be contracting. There's something to be examined in the ways in which people are corralled into you know, indebtedness in the way that Lazzarato talks about, that we are all becoming indebted, that we're mortgaging our futures, that different forms of debt peonage are what? A kind of unsustainable um, consumer-led economy which no longer has the wage relation to Phoenix. And you know, somehow we'll borrow different things, we'll kind of sell something for the future, our thoughts will be part of that, my likes will be part of that, all of that is some other way of getting things out. I mean, three people in the room nodding, that's great because there are the three people I know have read that book. Good job, someone from Perk came. <laughs> you can say what, explain what I'm on about after. Right. Um, so th that's that. But I think all of that makes us things very difficult to understand now. That's a kind of undecided and changing map of the undead. We know it's including resurrecting pro pro pockets of elite life in unexpected settings. You know, the global economy, of course, is not just the poor over there. And the more and more you look around the world, everyone who's got links in the global south knows it. Suddenly, these hyper-rich people are in your neighbourhood, even in really poor peripheral neighbourhoods. Well, not even the, the urban centres anymore. That's some strange stuff, isn't it? That's relatively recent. Qu quickly built their kind of walled enclosure, <coughs> literally in the last 25 years, as far as I can tell. And, of course, alongside that, some of what the last session was talking about, we've been extending the status of undeadness in other locations, including seemingly metropolitan <coughs> um, locations. Not that the poor were not always in the metropolis, but the level of hollowed out, um, you're never going to be any use to me, even the pretense of basic welfare that we used to operate on is not available to you, because who cares in the end? You and your kids, you can live or die in temporary housing because we're letting... And you know it. You know, it's, not, it's not even a pretense. You know, we're not even pretending that this is failing welfare. This is what's coming next. This is, this is what, when we don't want to play that welfare game. And I did, I did think, absolutely, I do know that welfare contracts are colonial prizes. But they're not only colonial prizes. They're to do, with the, to do with the contest about local resources and they're also to do with the moment in which you think this population is worth making an accommodation with because in the end I want them to get up for work in the morning. But now we're in a place where actually all of you, even if you could manage to get up for work in the morning, the work, I don't want anything from you. So that's kind of, oh, 
what goes on then. Right. So then I wasn't sure who was haunting who. I think in the older debates, you know, the older conceptualizations of um, how undeadness and zombiness and zombification were spoken about. And I thought, when I was trying to think, oh, what kind of party am I coming to? Well, maybe this was your party, but clearly isn't that. That, um, that there's an idea that there's a living metropolis which steals all the world's resources, and then there's the um, made monstrous others of the world who are kind of laughing upon the bats. That those Romero movies, isn't it? I know the zombies knocking on the lift. And it's like, oh, I'm in the lift, kind of trying to do my wage duration economy, but then you know, zombies are knocking on the lift. <laughs> right. I think that idea that the outside is haunting the metropolis is emblematic of a particular, potentially high imperial moment. And as something like a different moment of financial capital plus ecological crisis, hollows out the means of life from different and extending populations, the membership of the undead also expands. So in this moment where there's a battle between aliveness equals sustainability or aliveness equals productivity, and both of those two framings, which I'll better stop talking about, you'll ask me about later, both of those options are rerouted through elite fantasies of survival through domination. How can I... How can people who think they've got, they don't even think they've got stuff, they've got stuff. The people who've got stuff are thinking, what is aliveness? Is aliveness a way of oh, sustainability, green capitalism in this place? Or is it productivity? Or is it some combination? But both those things, how can they be remade as, if anyone's going to survive, it's us. And it's, we're going to use our resources and power to do that. And I, Probably makes me sound bananas, but I hope it made some sense to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think you must have been at the Red Cloud Party. Um, yes. <laughs> like zombies. Yes, I know. I, I'll send you my paper okay, on right zombies. Right. Yes, <laughs> um, it's just just final proofs were sent off uh, yesterday. Um, okay, so. Um, I have to admit, I, I, I did sort of, technically, although you were very gracious, insert myself into this panel at the very end. Um, uh, so I, I do think there's a nice symmetry that we sort of started with Jerome and then end with, so kind of why don't, why would we pay sovereign debt and then end with um, should we abolish household debt. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, Paul has given me a, a very kind introduction um, about me and this project was really an attempt, you know, as an ac academic, to kind of solve a couple of internal, um, you know, struggles, and then kind of externally, you know, external uh, troubles that were sort of imposed on me by asking a question like, "Why have you never written a book?" And um, the the answer to that was quite a, a kind of trajectory issue, which was that I began studying household debt um, in my, you know, doing an MA here at Sussex actually um, in about 2002 or 2003, something like this. And then I made it into a PhD project, and I initially tried to go to SPRU and the LSE. I tried to do it, you know, as an economist, but it, you know, absolutely not. I mean, I, I, to be say, to say I was laughed at um, would make it sound like it was a joke, when really it was more like humiliation, right? Uh, but I knew I was onto something, and I, you know, I'm, um, you know, I'm not one to give up, um, even if I did take it over personally. Uh, it didn't deter me. So I, began, I continued to um, pursue this um, study of debt as uh, something, you know, I just had this sense that something was changing and debt was a key aspect of that change. And I wanted to study um, what debt was doing and how it was doing it. Now, of course, I'm studying from the period of, of 2002, approximately 2003, until uh, I complete at the you know, very end of 2006, beginning of 2007. So I go about, as a PhD student, shopping around my project to various conferences and so on. And again, to say I was laughed at would be a slight, um, is to make light of, of, of many of the extremely patronizing, belittling, demeaning remarks I would get about basically you're stupid uh, because you don't understand how finance works. Um, there's nothing wrong with debt. Can't you see how everybody's getting rich? Uh, you know, I, you know, I just, you know, I, there's a wealth effect. That was the one, the wealth effect, the wealth effect. Um, 
Uh, you think debt now is bad? Back in my day, I used to pay 18%. Back in my day is like literally the, the con. Like I just immediately switch on and get a lot of back in my day. Back in my day, we paid 18% on our mortgages and now we pay 2%. And that, no, there's nothing wrong with debt. So, uh, you know, to, I, so I always had to sort of persevere against this kind of constant pushback. And this is why I didn't write a book. So uh, this is still answering this question. And then... Uh, I, I graduate, I, I get a, you know, get my PhD, I, I go off to do uh, a teach for a little while and then do it, get a postdoc. Up in Manchester, the credit crunch hits, right? 2008, the crisis hit. Turns out postal debt was a really big issue. Um, the, the story I always tell is my, my supervisor had told me I needed to take an entire chapter out of my PhD in which I analyzed why household debt was a systemic risk to um, you know, the Anglo-American economies, that this actually constituted a systemic risk. And he actually said, take it out, right? Because you do not, that will not age well. Don't start with a prediction. Don't end with a prediction. Don't say anything so um, futuristic that can be easily disproven, right? So, mm -hmm. Yes, sir, of course, sir. Uh, some excellent advice. Take out that chapter. It actually made it so my, all my tables were not aligned properly because I forgot to renumber what, you know, when I took out that chapter. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the crisis hits, boom. Oh, oh my God, household debt is a big issue. Oh, it's so important. Where's that chapter? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And then, uh, so then I think, okay, uh, uh, you know, obviously you have to trans you put your PhD into a book. Okay, good, good. And so I start shopping it around. Oh, Verso doesn't want it. David Harvey says that uh, household, he's writing a book on it. Um, yeah. um, <laughs> what, yeah, exactly. What about the, oh, no, Paul Krugman writes in the New York Times? Turns out household debts replacing stagnating wages. That's literally my thesis. Literally what I said. So, Paul Krugman says it. He's writing a book about it. Sorry, right? So, and then it's like I want to write a a, a, a book called Broke. So I pitched a Broke. That's what I was going to call it. Pitched a book. Talked to a journalist. Six months later, he published a book called Broke on Household Debt. You can look it up and you'll find his name. <laughs> Do you know, like, I just couldn't get traction because who was I to talk? You know, first I was an idiot and then I was late to the party, right? So, like, do you know who, what authority did I ever have to speak on these issues? So, oh, come sit, sit. sit. Um, uh, also, I started having children. <laughs> They're going to start streaming. Um, so, I had this kind of effect where I didn't have a monograph uh, as an academic. I, I chose to write peer-reviewed uh, papers. And I didn't do too shabby at that, so I'm not complaining, but that was my strategy. And then after the, so many of those, I got asked, you know, why don't you have a monograph? And that was my only answer. Bad timing, really, uh, because the really innovative topic I wanted to write about, nobody wanted to hear about it until everybody wanted to hear about it, and then far more important people than me wanted to write about this, this issue. So it, I kind of was silenced in a lot of different ways, oh, yeah. yeah, through a lot of different pra practices. So we come full circle to then me, uh, you know, researching debt in the post-crisis period, researching austerity. I meet some very inspiring people, um, Joel uh, here, uh, Fanny, uh, Vika, um, various uh, uh, groups within London that are working around uh, debt resistance. Some of the books, not all of them, are bad that are coming out about debt. You know, I read David Graeber's book in which he kind of points to this, these issues around debt as being quite long and historical. Um, creditocracy, you know, all of these kind of thinking through these bigger kind of social theory books. Um, and always they kind of end with this idea of, well, we could cancel debt, but I sort of leave that to someone else to do. So I kind of got this idea, well, then fine. You know, if I'm going to write a book and I'm going to add my voice to this very crowded <laughs> field of people and, and, and watching each new book come up on something that you know a lot about, although you're happy sort of makes you feel like, yeah, why don't I write a monograph? And it's very short, by the way, this book. It's not even that long. Uh, but I, So I just wanted to dip my toe in. And I wanted to try to, um, you know, my internal desire to take what I'd learned and turn it into something that could be used Again, through the inspiration of, of meeting uh, people like the Forum Research for Action. Uh, but that very idea was precisely sort of what I was looking to do, put my research into action. Uh, and this kind of external pressure of, you're an academic, why don't you have a book? Um, and that's how the kind of project came to being. I, I no sooner signed the contract than I found out I was pregnant again. Uh, spent two months with my head down the toilet, uh, as I would normally do when I'm expecting. Uh, the project gets stalled. Uh, I have to, you know, 
you know, I'm not a very happy pregnant lady, so, you know, it doesn't really work out as planned because it's a short book. So instead I decide that, you know what, I'm going to take that time when the baby's an infant and I'm all alone in the house over winter and I'm going to write the book then. So I write this book with the baby literally suckling at my teat on this side, speaking about social reproduction, pardon everybody, I hope that doesn't offend anyone, uh, and then a massive bulldog laying on my legs. So I, I can't even move, right? They like keep me stuck. Yeah, but, it, you know, I'm like, okay, just do it. And the thing was that this made me not write like an academic. Because I couldn't access my books. I, I just had to sit and write and just say it as clearly as I could. And I also had, you know, the fog of hormones. Um, so I was kind of, you know, really, in a lot of ways, liberated me from all this kind of academic baggage. And really, uh, again, I took my inspiration for the book uh, from Brett Scott's um, book, um, A Heretic's Guide to Global Finance. Uh, and his idea of hacking, you know, creatively hacking the financial system. Uh, Clea, you know, Clea spoke about the Heretical Finance Reading Group at Perk, and, and we took that name from, from him as well, in this kind of spirit of being a heretic, a dissenter, a non-conformist, uh, a voicing, an opinion that is at odds with what is generally accepted. So I, you know, I really took inspiration from the idea of reclaiming the heretic um, as, as somebody who's always disrupting uh, and always acting against general, uh, generally accepted opinion, uh, both welcome to some, but but also can make power appear, uh, as Femke does, uh, uh, you know, in sort of provoking power to, to make itself uh, appear as the heretic speaks against it. So, in that vein, I, I thought about how can I use all of this knowledge that I have about debt, household debt, global finance, politics, and speak about debt cancellation as something very practical, right? So I, I, I was really concerned with um, the politicization of debt uh, in, in a context of depoliticization and what that might mean. So um, part of what that meant, for example, is the term abolish. So do we abolish, you know, should we abolish household debt? First it was forgiveness, right? Should we forgive household debt? But obviously, you know, uh, <laughs> Fanny knows, Fanny gave me started talking to you about this one time. <laughs> forgiveness and its sort of connotation that a sin has been committed, right? Yeah. So that forgiveness is something that is granted. Um, then we went with cancelling for a while, and I think, uh, I still use debt, debt cancellation as a kind of very straightforward term, but abolish was decided very specifically to draw in the concept of abolition, right? So it does link to the ghosts of empire in that, in that sense, and then an abolitionist movement, because I, I really was struck, and, and here, doing my PhD with Robbie Shilliam here at Sussex, really uh, um, informed me on this one in, uh, in his work on in it, explaining kind of enslavement as a process. So you know that we have to think about enslavement as actually an active process. It isn't something, people are not born slave, they are enslaved uh, through a very active engagement. And for, for me, the connection here is with legality, right? So the contract, the debt is a contract, right? So we must abolish the contract, right? We must uh, use abolition as a, as a kind of, um, we're not cancelling it as if, oh yeah, let's just rethink it. Uh, oops, that was a mistake, I'll cancel that contract. Uh, you know, like you have your fees cancelled. Uh, nor is it forgiving, right? It is abolishing, right? And, and that was kind of the connection here with how do we politicize um, debt. So part of it as well, uh, and the tone of the book, is really about taking, I try to enact depoliticization in this book. So I, I really try to take the ground that has been created around debt as this technical process, right? Finance is deeply technical, right, and, and so complex. Um, and, you know, this idea that, oh, you know, you have to know how to do it to be allowed to do it, right? And you have to know what it is to truly act against it. Uh, and that space, especially around central bankers, of being independent, you know, they're, they're independent arbiters. So I am in a very uh, heretical way sought to write the book in, in the same sort of language of depoliticization. So uh, I, I'm completely aware that I do not hold unpolitical views around debt, uh, and I'm very much pitching towards an audience that would already 
agree that debt cancellation is, is, is politically a, 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 an important way forward, but I wanted to write it in a language of depoliticization as a way of hacking finance, because that's how I think finance has its power, is through this incredibly depoliticized language that it uses around its techniques, uh, around its products. So I wanted to um, use that uh, and kind of hijack it, again, hack depoliticization as a tool for making a very radical argument in a very unradical way, okay? So the argument uh, starts with the individual because we understand debt as a kind of individual thing between an individual debtor and, a, and an individual le uh, lender. And I try to talk about how if we imagine that indebtedness is a fault that people have, you know they can't add properly, right? They don't. They don't know what compound interest is, or they don't understand the terms uh, of the debt that they're taking on, right? So why you get these big long terms and conditions, right? This is the language of financial literacy, financial inclusion, right? Like we're all a bit dim, so you know um, that's why you're in debt because you don't, you can't add properly, or you know you're bad at math, uh, and really start from that. Start, you know, this is the first way we depoliticize it, is we personalize it, right? It's an individual failing that you have, either in mathematics or in just basic citizenship. You know, you want to take something for free and not pay it back, right? You're morally, uh, individually, kind of morally uh, not right. It, 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 that's why you get into debt. And say, well, these things are true. How can we understand the escalation of debt? Yes, you know, in in oh God, that's fast. <laughs> uh, in such a short, you know, in such a short space of time, right? And it said, well, if, if this is an individual failing, it's one that many, many, many people have, and a growing number of people have um, year on year. If we look at how much debt has grown, and that then very quickly shifts to the kind of systemic logics of debt, uh, and that is the, the argument around debt dependence. And and here I took inspiration from the debt audits that people do at the individual level, these kind of debt freedom movements that, that people see, they take on as a very individual level, you know, to think about how we're all dependent on debt, right? The entire financialized system. So individuals are dependent on debt, banks are dependent on debt just to make money, uh, like literally produce enough currency and circulation they need to be issuing debt contracts. But crucially that the government, you know, and the state is dependent on debt to, um, again, replace the welfare state that it's pulling away, to finance higher education, which feeds directly into the labor market. It needs citizens to be in debt, for example, to travel to work, to get car loans and, and put their, their petrol on the credit card or their transport. You know, they need to, this cash flow. Uh, so there's a huge dependent value added tax. How much of that is just bought on credit and, and then paid interest to? So these kind of systemic logics. And then quickly, you know, moving from the systemic logic to the moral economy, okay? So, you know, the moral economy is both a weapon uh, for the lender and the debtor alike, but I just think debtors haven't quite captured the logic of morality uh, in, in, in debt, besides um, of the indebted. So, uh, part of it is that when you can't make an economic argument against debt, can't, you know, debt abolition, you, you make a moral argument against it. Like, oh God, if we cancelled everyone's debt, you know, then that would just reward the profligate, right? That would just reward the bad people in society for being bad, right? Um, which again, obviously, we can see straight through when we remember that the banks had their, their debts cancelled uh, in wake of the financial crisis. So, uh, and it, but it's also about reclaiming the moral economy that says, you know, what is finance for, okay? And what, what does it really do in society? Um, and here I use the kind of water metaphor. So I try to explain that debt and credit is like uh, water circulating through a, a system. Uh, the banks actually uh, own the, the, the switching stations that, that pump water through the system. Uh, the central bank... Uh, operates as the overseer, but what we see in, in how debt is being reconfigured is whole portions of society are drowning in it, and others are left uh, like arid fields to just, you know, those that are excluded for whatever reason are just left to wither and die on the vine for lack of water, uh, and then there are those that are just reaping the rewards. And therefore, within this kind of logic then, 
the, the argument of debt cancellation is quite straightforward, right? We can, you need to cancel debt, first of all, to uh, repair the damage done by indebtedness. This is a damage that we openly acknowledge and has already been dealt with through massive bailouts to the financial sector in the wake of 2008. So we know the damage that this debt has done, but it was the lenders that were bailed out. Uh, and again, we can, we can link here uh, through the, the, the examples of abolition, right? So who gets bailed out here is, is the lender uh, and the slave owner, not, not, the, not the enslaved or, or the debtor. Uh, and that we need to complete this bailout. We need to, to, to kind of bookend it uh, in order to move beyond it. Because I think most people can understand the zombie kind of economy that we live in is one that we never got past uh, the financial crisis. We're still living in this, un as the undead, in this kind of state of undeath. Um, and so, the, so then the, this kind of moral economy of, of, of making uh, finance have a purpose uh, rather than rent extraction, rather than, you know, this was Adam Smith, you know, reaping what they do not sow, mm -hmm. uh, and this kind of rent, rent here, but also morally to provide that kind of balancing between, you know, how do we on the one hand justify massive bailouts for lenders, uh, uh, for that side of the contract, but not uh, for the debtor itself. So the, in that kind of moral argument, I make very practical claims around, um, the kind of refinancing of high cost debt. So if we imagine we live in an era of, of low interest rates, interest rates are actually again, uh, in Germany for example, has issued bonds at negative interest rates. So we imagine interest rates are actually below zero. How is it that we're paying 18% on credit cards uh, uh, or 6% on a, on a car loan or a student loan or even 2% on a mortgage? 2% on a 350,000 pound mortgage is a lot of money. And by the end of 35 years, you're still paying 1.67. You know, you're still almost, you know, many times over paying much more back to the bank than, than, than they ever uh, gave to you because they, they get that money at zero. Technically, they just make it, but it, market rates are, 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 are less than zero. So we need to, if, if we are publicly subsidizing the banking system post-2008, there is an argument to say that long-term refinancing is the right option for the household sector. Why is it that they are paying so much more uh, and having to carry this burden? Because all it's doing is fostering further debt dependence. The banks aren't restructuring, the economy is not restructuring. But crucially then to look at write-offs. Old debt, already discharged debt, these are examples of debt jubilee that have already come out and, and just scaling those up and, and saying they are practical. And the key here for me is to target the debt itself the stock of outstanding debt, that this is what needs to be cancelled. I want to firmly and forever take the focus away from the debtor, okay? So many cases of debt cancellation or, or debt abolition are about, you know, these, these, the, 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 the story of the, 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 the indebted, right, that suffer, you know, that, that they have to kind of like, it just reminds me of Red Nose Day or whatever other charity it is where we have to trot out suffering people and say, you know, they deserve some form of relief. No, actually, the debt is what needs to be gone. Those people will benefit from it uh, regardless. But let's not limit abolition to something that must be deserved uh, through a state of sort of... Um, you know, how, how, however we want to phrase, you know, the way in which we have to imagine people deserving um, abolition of their debts. So these kind of techniques are, uh, 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 that I put forward in the book are already used widely in all kinds of scenarios. Uh, and it's really about putting them all together as a series of pick and mix. Pick what, if you, we can cancel debt 10 different ways from Sunday. Pick one way. We could do it that way. We could do it this way. And it's deliberately sort of providing a, a range of instruments. But always along this line of saying, you know, this is, it's not revolutionary. And, and that's sort of what I, I remember Ben Fine at SOAS said to me, this is the most unrevolutionary thing I've ever read. And I thought, well, thank you. <laughs> because it's really not revolutionary, it's, it's very practical. And I think that always imagining that, that uh, abolishing household debt would have to come on the back of some you know, debt strike or, or great mass refusal uh, is to kind of imagine something much more difficult to achieve than, than abolishing household debt actually would be to achieve as a financial mechanism. 
Uh, rather, what needs to be mobilized here is a, the political <coughs> mechanism to make it happen. the genesis of 20th century field of international development, it actually is rooted in the idea that poor people, well known people are not just, you know, it's the idea of threat. Mm. <laughs> they're not just unfed, but they're actually threat. And therefore you need to yeah. you need to monitor them, govern them, manage them so that they remain docile and, and grateful. Absolutely. You know, so I was just thinking that you know that undead is also connected with the idea of threat. And, and, and the que to, to ask a question, I really found your research fascinating. I wonder those who are the descendants uh, and have received a reparation for giving up on slaves. Mm -hmm. So in, in a, not reparation, I think it's the wrong word. Compensation. I mean, uh, have you been, sp I mean, have you researched their views or how they feel about benefiting from Short answer is no, but I'll come back to it. <laughs> yeah. So, should, should we collect the other questions and then? Sure. Yeah. 
Sure. Um, I wanted to wrap the three together. Uh, thank you all for your presentation. One <coughs> is, Kathy, I was thinking about how um, the welfare of the guaranteed market um, that the British uh, get the planters away by prioritizing beets, right, which drops uh, sugarcane and England to a whole other problem, which then makes it just liability, and then we get this um, compensation. But I wanted to um, speak to your question about what the rebellion to the Anderson sisters. So it's something really important, which when you look at the record in Jamaica, often some of the big rebellions, uh, planters get paid off. So there's payoffs happening before abolition that one should uh, look at. I would focus on Clarendon, which when I did my GIS uh, hurricane thing, they were like, this is where the GIS folks are like, this is where if you're surveying land, people will break your equipment. Mm -hmm. And because it's the most rebellions happen there, people are real serious about land, and there are a lot of slave rebellions. So to track the record locationally around how people got paid out. And so people were paid paid out for destroying property, so that people would be starved and kept in, a, in an undead state, so rebellions couldn't keep living. So that's really quite important around the that happened before abolition of uh, compensation. Um, and also um, fungibility, which Tiffany Lagava King talks quite a lot about with land and, and where humans move into land, mm -hmm. I guess a really big one. I try not to cite a lot of Americans because I'm in Canada, but I really love her work. I really shot them with her on, on that project. But Joanna uh, wanted to ask about like thinking through um, uh, ideas of land as inalienable that gets changed. I wonder about thinking about the household and the home as inalienable, which gets changed now into debt, right? Like, mm -hmm. if we think about like this idea that somehow your sanctity of your children eating, and thank you to everyone for bringing your children. I think they're the future, and if we don't see them in the room, then we're not like, who are we writing for? It's really a big thing for me, even as a non-mom. So I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm trying to draw, mm -hmm. just think about the home um, and this in, idea of inalienability, which now starts to happen with um, debt. And I did work for Royal Bank of Canada for seven years with credit cards, mm -hmm. and I learned how to explain uh, how to explain interest five different ways by listening to people because people shame around mathematics yes. is really huge mm -hmm. and to be able to listen to them and go do you have a pen and paper and a, and a minute yeah. let me show you how even though somebody else is offering you a better rate how you can calculate it for yourself yeah. about whether or not that deal mm -hmm. is actually for you mm -hmm. so just uh, wanted to add that all the many things I seem to have done yes seven years at the Royal Bank <laughs> yeah yeah where I did not have a student loan but I worked for the bank and was I would rather take a student loan I'm like honey you will be working for the bank then so yeah. Yeah. ways in which people think about things anyway mm -hmm. this life <laughs> so there's Max and thank you all there's a, another great panel yeah. um, with so much to offer I want to start uh, with, with Gargi's intervention, which I, I think is so important um, right now. And I, I'm struggling uh, to develop this language for a new moment of, of horrific mass human disposability uh, that echoes the form of disposability of hospitals and renovates them in Absolutely. incredible yeah. ways. Um, and, the, and the sort of candor with which that's being now announced, yeah. especially by uh, incredible. Secret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this leads me to two fears I have about the future of reparation and restoration on the one hand and debt cancellation on the other. And so I'm going to share the fears just as, a, as to put them in the room, because it's, we're all friends here. Um, my fear about uh, the futures of, of reparation and restoration are playing out in Canada right now, where I, I live and work, where we have a government that has officially declared itself and in fact staked its political uh, future on the idea of, rec of, of a state-led process of reconciliation with indigenous people, very specifically around the processes of uh, seizing indigenous children and putting them in residential schools, but much more broadly this promise that if the Canadian state, led by a liberal government, undertakes these processes of first a kind of moral apology, but then various forms of financial compensation, the problem of the ghosts of colonialism will be absolved. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen with that is, first of all, that the government does that with one hand, while the political of the economy of the country continues to be colonialism, pipelines, extraction, etc. But second, that we are now seeing the rise of a revanchist right mm -hmm. in the country, who interestingly, in their most candid, will say, like, look, 
we're in a different world now. This is the world of human disposability. Why are these people getting uh, handled from the government when all these other people are falling off the um, yes. falling off the ship, so to speak? Um, and there's something very dark about what's happening. Uh, on the one hand, having a, a sort of residual liberal impulse towards a false capitalist form of reconciliation that is the, the false friend or the true friend of a kind of reactionary impulse. This leads me to my concern about debt cancellation, which I think is going to happen because I think we can see, and I think your book really points out, this, the, the present is completely unsustainable. I did just, if I, instead of making a long story, I'll simply paint a, a picture of a possible future, which is that seeking re-election, Donald Trump uh, proposes to wipe out uh, mortgage debts of Americans who have owned their homes, but for whom no one in the family has been to jail. Yeah. And you have basically racialized debt forgiveness to marshal a, um, a massive white base. Um, in order to basically create a government calibrated towards yeah. these new forms of disposability yeah, along yeah. racialized lines. Awesome. So these are my these are my terrorists. <laughs> please please help me. Cool. So it's Tom and then Jordan and then my sister, and then we'll probably come back to people because they'll be overwhelmed. So many thoughts arising in my mind. Which one should you say? Debt cancellation. I mean, historically. Um, it has been achieved, if that's the right word. Uh, what it means is the destruction of assets, because the debt is not an asset. Um, it's usually been achieved by war. That was the story of the Second World War, the day the crisis in the 1930s was resolved. Um, that wasn't the question we're going to ask. I want to ask a simple question to Cathy, and if I may, a brief comment. Um, my question is Has your list of 69 people been published? I'd love to see who they were, were and where they did. Um, my comment arises from the way of this discussion. Um, and that is, you know, I go back into the, the, the mists of time. The, in the distant past, there was a thing called the hippie movement and the new left. And, uh, uh, the alternative society, which they were trying to create. Um, you might succeed, but there you go. Um, one of their concepts was demystification. And I think that's what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, um, don't listen to the high priest and their complex language and everything else. That, that's all there to mystify you. And the, the, what, what people are actually should be doing is to decent, make things understandable so that people know how to, how to use uh, how to um, One thing that is very, uh, unless I'm very much mistaken, I certainly have not heard among all the disciplines that are represented. I haven't heard it from anyone who can say that they're Say what? They're an economist. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there is an economist in the room. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. <laughs> one of the, the uh, wonderful, I know it's, it's, up, it's a long time ago now, but a uh, wonderful deep book of demystification of debt by one of the friends, Susan George, is a paper of debt. Yeah, and great. she has a phrase that's stuck in my mind and for over 30 years, it's been in my mind in her preface. She said, um, uh, now, in a rather defensive mode, saying, who, the sort of thing you're talking about, who, how, how do you have uh, the right to talk about this? And she said, I am not an economist. Sometimes I think that that is a secret, my secret weapon. Yeah. <laughs> because she had not been inculcated in all the arcane yeah. theories of economics and finance and so on, and all those, what, the jargon. She was trying to see the world as it was and explain it as she could reasonably uh, understand it. And that is what everyone here is trying to do. That's what makes it such a brilliant, stimulating conference. Because people are not blinded, blinded by this pseudoscience. Let, let me leave it with that. <laughs> so, John, this is here, and then back to the speakers. Um, so, I have two broad questions slash comments. The first is, I think, and maybe you guys have talked about this to the extent that you think it's relevant, but all three of the papers um, you gave seemed very, uh, the core arguments of all three of them seemed um, intent on some sort of deconstruction of, uh, or maybe even killing of liberal narratives, liberalism. Because that's actually something, a word that hasn't come up a lot. Um, 
problems so far in this conference, but really all of you talked about the ways that liberal narratives of empires and advancing democracy have put people on the outside of the country used to justify the various forms of freedom and that was just a sort of theme that I think. How how central to the to, to the story of, of finance, capital, and empire is my story is liberalism. How central is it to to remaking those worlds is critiquing and getting rid of um, so that's one question. The other question is more, more wildly speculative. And it's about um, not undead things, but it's about specifically dead things. Um, so I'm struck in Paul, your opening, the first thing you talked about was the zones, right? Where, in fact, there is a, a literal absence of dead bodies that constitutes new financial worlds. But also, the sort of, if we were to push your theorization a little further, the ultimate, unproductive, meaningless thing is the dead body. Not even the undead, but it's the, the dead body, right? That we then have to do, you know, it's one of the sort of the things that's up there with the incest taboo of being constitutively human, and that we hang on to dead bodies, and we do things with them, and we make them work for us, and we incorporate yeah. them into our own social worlds. Um, so I'm wondering if there's, there's a way in which theorizing the absence of the dead body in finance capitalism, mm -hmm. the presence of dead bodies elsewhere, reclaiming meaninglessness, uselessness as its own sort of new constituent form of, of social, political reality in the ways I think you're trying to push us, uh, push us towards. Yeah, thank you. I'm trying to, um, trying to be when we talk about that translation, that translation, I think we have to be very careful about the practices that accompany this debate. And there are many examples that show that in as much that translation, of course, has its good sides on the material angle. It is accompanied by practices that to an even higher level of governmentality and certain norms that are very high and that on the one example for that is the hippie country literature that sort of like the have reflected for countries um, who were then uh, who were given a chance to get rid of their debt by the IMF and World Bank. But this went hand in hand with many practices that focus on paying down, adhering to more and more norms and getting under a kind of governmentalist umbrella. So this is this is something um, this is a way of uh, putting even more governmental power on these on these countries. And um, in other cases which I find even in the context was a suggestion by the Yale philosopher Thomas Pogge who said, okay, countries that are off, that are suffering from odious debt um, should be given a chance to um, become resource, resource protectorates where the resources of one country should be put under the law of nations in order to have some kind of, like, that's called mortgage, um, in order to get rid of that debt, but also to have their resources controlled um, under rational, under the rational and wise um, auspices of the of the United Nations, which sounds even more rigid than what I'm saying. Um, with a short, I think um, what you are thinking about that translation, um, so I think it's very interesting. Have a look what that might mean also in terms of the practices. Can I just very briefly before we get to the point of doing this? The thing that comes to mind is that there's a really interesting um, paper by Bobby Valentine, who's a, he's in a business school in London, but it's in organisation studies, I think, on network capitalism. And he's kind of using the tools of organisation studies, which are normally applied to studying you know, financial and business markets, managerial stages, and looking at uh, organisational form predicated on debt as a means to. Uh, Accumulation. So it's kind of tying Mendo's work on uh, network politics to uh, organization studies, management, management studies approach, which may be an interest, I don't know. But, um, are you okay to go along this way? Yeah. Okay. Not much to talk. I, I might, I might um, link and use the question by, no, we didn't force that people say, <laughs> give us their money back, you might be friends with Carlson. But actually, yeah, BBC did, though, it was so there's quite a lot of things that BBC did, and um, Uncle Randy Alex gets to do some. That's a really interesting thing to do, but it's a different set of questions, really. Um, 
to, to look at the traces of those individuals and to look at what that means for this particular locality. So it's looking at, you know, trying to look at the inclusive history of slavery in Brighton is in some way different than knocking at the door of number 39 Bedford Street and saying, you know, do you know what happened in this house? Do you know where that money came from? I think that's a really interesting thing to do. Uh, but it's a slightly different set of questions, which is unearthing the myth of this. I think children in every locality in Britain, <laughs> every local town, should know its history in relation to slavery and its history in relation to colonialism in India and Ireland. And it's, uh, you know, should know its colonial history because it's so extended. So, no, we haven't gone knocking on doors. And there's a lot of value in that. But it's, it's not the point that we're involved in. Um, and actually, if you think about the fact that we've 69 so far, we haven't published any other ideas, we will. So we've 69 so far. That's 69 individuals and their families and their descendants. This is huge, do you know what I mean? In terms of, of, of how slavery is in the village of the country, in the village of the towns. And so that's what we're, what we're tracing. Then we're asking the question of who is a slightly different question, um, I think. Um, I'll try and go to these questions because I don't want to be taking some. Yes, Thank you very much for the talk. I think you're absolutely right to think about all those moments for Ben that we don't have because of the archive and the of the archive. So one of the really interesting things about Tortola, when he found it in the archive, was this was, I say, a, a, a conspiracy that was one month before Sham and Sam Shark fell in Indonesia. It was a few weeks after in the United States. Uh, the most important thing that all the people spoke about was Haiti. They spoke about the colours of Haiti, they were going to go to Haiti. So all of these kind of connections, these transatlantic connections of your value, which have been lost because of the way the archive works. Uh, but every time we find one of those connections, it's, it just, it's everything's comfortable. of them, and yet they're hidden. So bringing those histories to life in relation to this finance is, 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 is what's important. So anything we know about those values. And again, rebellion, not just in terms of our rebellion, that people know, but it's the same value in every, in every way that was we, we possible to rebel. But those um, interconnections are really interesting, and this is so close to go back to the shark, but it could be close to another 40 that we don't know um, any, anything about. Um, blah, 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 what was the other one? Oh, about um, apologies. Yeah, we were always aware that they were with an apology. You, you need to ask them for it, you need to demand they give it to you. But the reason why there was a, a, sometimes they apologise. So Tony Blair apologised to the Irish family, but he wouldn't apologise for slavery, and there's a reason for that. There was no one looking for reparations for the Irish family. Yeah. That's why. You know, where's the where's post of slavery? Yeah. 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 Your question, John, about, about what's wrong with it. <laughs> Actually, you know, with the current value, give me a liberal any day, because things have changed uh, in terms of, of, of the country one keeps. But the, the issue with, with liberals and apologies, and why apologies are easier than other forms of accounting for the debt of the past, and I would forgive him, but certainly no abolition of that debt, is that liberals can just simply be they can't do rage. And if they can't do rage, they can't look at the history of black growth, because that's the only way they lead to that. And they certainly can't look at the history of colonialism as what it is, which is white belt. It's got to be seen as something different. So liberalism can do sympathy. It is. It made sympathy. It's as Adam Smith. It can do sympathy. It can do the performance of imagination of yourself in someone else instead. But that's the limits of what it can do. Um, and therefore, in relation to dealing with the history of colonialism, it has so little um, to offer in relation to that, except for those kind of um, those half-assed apologies, which I think they should be forced to give. But it's, it's notable that they will give those apologies. Um, and it's the same way I think they will apologise for, for, for being called priests, but they won't deal with, yeah. with, with, with the contemporary what's happening in relation to other stuff in the matter and all these. They don't get money. So as long as there's no money involved, they'll apologise. Um, but they also can't deal with rage, and I think that, that, that's the real limitation of, of, of it. And I think that's. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, yes, I, I, I'm sorry about that, so I think that's background is down there. So I'm going to I was going to say something about demystification. I thought she could have said something about this too. Um, I don't have a way of justifying this. I'm going to say it in case it chimes with anyone else. I think one of the moments we're living through in with is with one in which better knowledge and demystification is revealed to bring you 
no or almost no additional leverage. And I really hear what you're saying about talking people through their options, but in the end, you can have a less bad option, but the place in which you are indebted is kind of a crappy one for most people. Which I know you're, you don't disagree with that, but so and even the things, and that's what I thought was I was thinking demystification. I wondered if the session before this one, which I thought was really interesting, but I kind of couldn't kind of process it. Yet, but there's also something because of the work that we collectively do, whatever kinds of organisation we work in, it's very hard to give up on the idea that understanding better will in itself be the change. Now that's quite. And I think collect, you know, on lots of issues, that's quite difficult for us, isn't it? That actually, the knowing, and even the knowing better sometimes can itself, which I think is back to poetry, that's a kind of pleasurable endeavour, isn't it? It's like Sherlockian. And, and I wondered if that's part, and she was kind of saying that about the artwork. It's not that knowing this will make you be able to do it, but you can see it and position it. And there's also, it's beautiful, the, the beautiful trickiness of the, the financial endeavour. And to visualise that which um, works by invisibilising, there's all kinds of... That's art, isn't it? Of course it's art, I know, but it, it's art in other realms as well. So I think there's something... Then, then what game are we in? And I don't know if it links back to liberalism. My daddy, my back. daddy. <laughs> How liberal. Do you want to raise your back? <laughs> We're all dreadfully jealous and wish we had a toddler. And I wish my kid was with a toddler to come, but now they're stuck on the screen, can't move yeah. their head off the screen to come. But um, li liberalism has worked historically and even now by saying <clears throat> this is the boundary of, in which you can be human, have rights, in which polity works, and then there's a boundary beyond. Most of my work is about that boundary. And so the story I'm telling about the undead is about, okay, well, actually already the formulation of liberalism is always about that undeadness as well. I kind of hear what you're saying about dead bodies, but that's a parallel and different set of logics. What I'm trying to say that there's also always a population who are not subject to genocide, because you need to remember lots of people are subject to genocide, lots of people are not here. There's real bodies piled up around the place, and yet there's other populations who are somehow positioned in this in-between state, not worthy of being sustained, and yet somehow not either the object of genocide. And that, you need to kind of have all of those in your head to even think about the history of liberalism. I guess. I don't know if I won't have anything else to say, really. That might be it. Um, okay, so um, the, the home and the inalienability of the home, um, I do think there is this kind, there is this strange way that is happening through the amount of contracts. You know, this every kind of mundane, everyday life has become um, so crucial to the kind of turning over and the, the social reproduction of fi financialization that that's exactly right that um, you know that the home see because I have three kids I just talk about it right you just yeah. if, if, if you ever stop right you just never say anything right so just, you know, I'm totally fine with her staying here I don't mind I just talk a bit louder um, so um, yeah this kind of I mean if we imagine the size of the loan book for, for residential property Right, and I mean, do you know it off the top of your head? Caroline, no, it's a bit, you know, the size of the, you know, just mortgages, right? This major lender. I mean, this is a huge cash cow for them because they have figured out that basically, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs says shelter is really high up there. <laughs> I, you're going to be my first priority payment yeah, yeah. of my income is going to go to shelter, right? And then if you have kids, the next ones go to the kids. The childcare, food, right, and they figure that out, so they're able to kind of exploit this this need that we have, right? So they've grafted onto the social reproductive dynamics, because I think it was said, I can't remember who said it, how finance kind of predates capitalism. Finance is a very old relation, and I think that's precisely why, because finance is much more related to the social reproduction of, of the human species than it is to production in capitalism. Mm -hmm. Much, much closer mm -hmm. in its logics, in its profit streams, mm -hmm. right? That it's grafting itself on to these kind of very intimate relations. 
So, you know, I wrote a paper about that, talking about the social reproduction of debt, is that we care for our debts, right? We don't just, it's not just an item of expenditure, this is not an issue of, of math. We actually care for them, we mobilize caring resources in order to ensure that our debts are sustained, right? Um, so this is the kind of home, as, uh, you know, and, and, and the, this kind of right, uh, and how the home is featured. It is not an afterthought, it is not a secondary or a kind of smaller market, like real investment banking, no, no. Home mortgages, credit to households, is the profitability of, of, of the financial system because it's dumb money, and that's what they call it, right? When you're paying, whether it's your mortgage payment or your student loan payment, or if it's your, even your pension, Okay, and that links me to your point about the destruction of assets, right? Is that if you're just paying month on month, pulling it out of, out of your account, out of your present day income, straight into the financial sector, you are called dumb money. Because that money comes in whether the, the trader is profitable, whether the arbitrage was right, whether the, you know, the markets are high or low, that money's just going in every day. And that's why you get tax breaks on it. I mean, in Canada, where you get huge tax breaks on dumb money because the government says, well, to the, the banks, we'll give a, as soon as we give them a tax rate, everyone signs up for it. And it's dumb money. It's easy money. You're flowing that money without question. You don't have to earn it. You just have to enforce the contract. So I think that this kind of um, element of, of, of financialization is really important because it is not rooted through the productive economy. It is not a, a, a kind of late add-on. It is actually reconfigured the, the very logic of, of how finance is trying to sustain itself, especially after kind of cataclysm. Um, right. And I would like to point out as well that uh, historically, and the link to the undead is the killing yourself over your debts yeah. and the suicide. You know, the, the yeah. ultimate harm that debt causes is just... F off and die, right? Just but you're not meant to F off and die because then who's going to pay you? Well, debt? yeah, but exactly. But that's the kind of, you know you see that there's yeah, a kind yeah. of link yeah, yeah, there, absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. If you, you know, uh, the only way you're going to get out of it. That's why your loved ones are meant to take on your debt. Yeah, is words. to kill yourself, right? So there, there is a kind of connection there to how much. And in this day and age, people do sacrifice food. They do allocate resources elsewhere to meet debt payments, right? So they're already incurring harm just to sustain uh, their their interest payments. And when we think about we have to destroy assets, that's the other aspect, because this is the main argument against that debt cancellation that will be mobilized and, and the darker forces that have to be dealt with as well, is that effectively debt enriches the 5% of households, top 5% of households. And debt does not come from savers. It's not people's savings. So they always say you can't cancel debt because it'll be someone's savings. Who it will destroy is the pension funds, who are already going bankrupt. Uh, as you, 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 uh, so it does, um, it does amount, so crucially debt cancellation isn't just about relief for the debtor, that's part of it, but it is also about destroying uh, the very assets, the very toxic assets, uh, like the, the species extinction, right? So I can imagine that we go from residential mortgages that are bundled and securitized, uh, chopped and changed and circulated through the debt securities markets. As those, all that money is slushing around, some of it is being hived off in the search for yield to then uh, go and might as well swap some weather derivatives, some catastrophe derivatives, and some species derivatives, right? If we cut the, 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 the prime source of, of, of that water flow, that is just a trickle when it gets to, to species derivatives, but actually begins with residential mortgages, huge amounts of dumb money. And we even threaten that that is not a revenue for 40 years that you can anticipate. It might be, right now we, the, the system will respond with a, with a realignment, right? It will move around. So yeah, there is a, a dark side um, to it, but not all destruction it, you know, is bad in this case. But the other side of it is the kind of Trump using it. I, I do firmly believe that. Um, that it's, you know, it's possible. But it's, it's more that what that tells us is all the time, all along, all the people that say to me, you're crazy. This will never work. You're insane. It, you know, this is just crazy hippie, hippie talk, right? Uh, you know, uh, it'll never have a... And then turn around and the president will say it and it'll be done like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it is precisely to not listen to the people that say it can't be done because it's been already done. These instruments already exist. 
Uh, they've been deployed many times in the past 10 years, uh, but it's just who they're deployed for is the question. So I do think there is a, a real potential, and I'm very surprised at the allies I have on this book. The head, the lead economist at Citigroup, who splits his time between New York and London. He's literally a nylon. He flies out to, to, because he's the head economist of Citigroup. He, he's in both places. Loves this book. He thinks finally somebody's made a little sense. I, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit surprised it's the left that's come up with it, but I, you know, I, you know, but he's. On board. And then just last week, the chief economist of Lloyd's Bank said the same thing. Uh, he says, I advocated debt cancellation in 2008. I said we should have given mortgages a, a break, but it was, it was Larry Summers who said no. And he's like, and I did that because I, I worked in Indonesia in the East yeah, Asian crisis. Yeah, I was going to say about Citigroup, because Citigroup uh, manages, we know much more about development. Yeah, so he, yeah, he said, and, I, and that's where I first got, so there's a, a strange way in which, again, the depoliticized language sort of attracts some people, but it, it means that it is entirely possible. Why it's not happening is entirely down to political reasons. It's not because it's not possible or that I'm crazy. It's that uh, it's just not been, you know, it's, it's a political reason. It isn't the point that's being made. It's not the point you're making. The point's being made, it can happen only as a further technique of differentiation and impoverishing yes. some other. Yes, it can, absolutely. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a difficult, you know, at the end of the day, that's kind of a difficult thing for us, isn't it? Yeah. That even if the good ideas we come up with actually can be recuperated yeah. into yeah. them yeah. making yeah. some other people undead, yeah. which seems to be the game really, sorry, I shouldn't even come to this part <laughs> clearly. But yeah, that seems to be where we are. I thought that's what you were. Yeah. No, no, and I, and, I, and, I, and, I won't, and I won't deny it. I think that's absolutely right. And that it, in the same way as abolishing slavery didn't, didn't end, uh, you know, the harm and, and, and so on. Do you, or do abolishing slavery was followed by a period of reconstruction, and that's where the struggle was. That's when yeah. it was over. And, and what, what we've spoken about, too, is watching the strategies by which a white supremacist capitalist system reclaimed the yeah. Yeah. So, absolutely. The moment after. Yeah, just one hand. Do you want to end it? If the capitalist system worked in the way that we're told it works, those assets would have been destroyed in 2008 yes. if the bank, that's to say, if the banks had been allowed to come out. Yes. That would have, that would be, I mean, it would have had enormous economic repercussions. We mustn't blind ourselves to that. But that, that would have been the capital, yeah, not that the, would have been as well. yeah, the capitalist way. They were bankrupt, right? Off they went, together with their assets. And those people who owed money to them, you yeah, they don't have to be paid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that would have liberated the whole system in that sense. But, so well, no, it, absolutely. Talking, I mean, what 2008 said... It wouldn't be as severe as people are, uh, are trying to tell us. It's simply that they, the other people would have benefited from it. Uh, if it hasn't happened, so we don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's right. Yes, yes sir. Time to leave. Yes, sir. So, um, but, yeah, there is, there is a bar downstairs. And <laughs> in the longer term, as people who come from downstairs, I think we'll try and... Um, one of the things that was suggested yesterday, I think, was using the, the web page on yeah. the Reimagining Value website to kind of uh, um, store links to, to writings from people who couldn't be here, and we'll try, and I think when I was out with earlier, it was mentioned as well that there's two possible output publication values that uh, we've been talking to people about. So we will be in touch in various ways and hope to keep all these incredible conversations going through assorted media, email lists, and eventually <coughs> things on paper. Um, so, can we thank the discussion? Oh, yeah.